Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I am pleased to have Abu Bakr Salem on the show. He is the actor and the founder of Surgeon Studios, and their recent video game release, Tales of Kinzera Zhao, is out right now, and I have been just knee-deep in this world, and I'm thrilled to be chatting with you, sir. How are you? Oh, very well. Thank you. That's really lovely that you're, <laughs> that you're enjoying. <laughs> oh, very much. And of course, people may also know you from uh, your role in Assassin's Creed Origins as Bayek of Siwa. Mm. Uh, of the 13 Assassin's Creed games, the mainline games, it is consistently top one or two, really, really. And it all comes down to your your voice acting. Oh, and of thank course, you, man. My fa- I'm not just gushing. My family also very much enjoyed you in Raised by Wolves. Oh, um, amazing. It, it took me a while to put that together. I mean, that is, I think, <laughs> that is a compliment as an actor, right? It's like, wait a second. That's the same guy. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> you transformed. Great. I mean, that was a physicality to that one that, that I didn't realize that it was all the same guy. Hey, man, if I'm, if I'm not transforming, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> yeah. So um, I am a big Metroidvania person, like since Jump. And mm. uh, the last, I would say, maybe three or four years, maybe five years, it's been a, a renaissance of sorts in the Metroidvania space with Metroid Dread. We just saw Prince of Persia come out yeah. with the Metroidvania. Like, why make a Metroidvania now? Is it a is it a crowded place? Yeah, I mean, I don't. So I think the way that I've I sort of approached it is like again, you know, I was I'm very much led by story. I'm very much led by you know trying to use the art form to kind of deliver a message. And so for me, really choosing the the genre of the Metroidvania genre was because I felt like it was the best way of kind of showing grief. Because again, you know, you're throwing a character in the middle of nowhere. They have no idea. Like it's alien world. It feels hostile, dangerous. They can't prepare for it. But the longer you spend time in it, the more comfortable you get, right? And I think that is why I chose the genre. You know, it it kind of captures and encapsulates that feeling of grief in in the best way possible, um, really. And, I, you know, the thing is, it's like, yeah, I think we're very fortunate to be in in a time right now where like you know, the Metroidvania genre is almost, you know, it's coming to people who've never played Metroidvanias before as well. And I think that's what's really cool about it, right? Because it, it gives audiences and players a, a new space to jump into that it feels almost, um, what's the word? It, it, It feels like a, you know, like a callback to the old times, but at the same time, it, it, it feels fresh and new, which is really cool. And like, as you said, like you've got games, like for example, uh, you know, Prince of Persia, which is, you know, very much like this is like high end kind of, you know, what, you know, what companies can do in in that, in, in that sort of space. And then you've got games like either like Hollow Knight or, or even like the messenger, right. Or even Owlboy to a degree um, where it, it, it's a lot more smaller, but it still kind of um, pays homage to the genre in, in the best way. Yeah, it feels like we're in the golden age of Metroidvanias, and I say that as someone who played Metroid, like when it came out. Oh, amazing, amazing, yeah. Yeah. Now, the grief that we're talking about, and the grief that you alluded to was the untimely death of your father. Yes. And when something like that happens, uh, your life is is bisected into the before time and then the after time. It, It really is. Yeah. yeah, my uh, my wife uh, is uh, an Debele from Zimbabwe. We've been married for twenty five years. Oh wow! Her, we this is a total coincidence, but I ended up getting Tales of Kinzara Zhao uh, within a day or two of the twentieth anniversary of her father's death. So, oh, wow. with me playing the game and her watching the game, she was just kind of you know doing her phone thing, and I'm playing the game, and she starts hearing familiar words. And yeah. Like, Hang on a second. Who who is that? And and then we started talking about the game, and it was just a very kind of strange, uh, you know, constellation of everything intersecting at the same time. And I was yeah. like, yeah, he made this game because this is the strange world that he's been thrown into suddenly after your father died. You could have made a film, but you I know. Made this. <laughs> I know. And it's because mainly the reason why I did a game, because my father introduced me to games. You know, it was, it was, if, if, again, I wanted to make something that honestly respected him or honestly, I like, kind of paid how much to myself as well, to a degree of what I'm going through. You know, I, I, I remember the game I was playing the day I found out he was passing. It was the Witcher three. 
and like you know this is the thing and like i it, it was one of those ones where games have been so in my life and ingrained in my life especially with my father like it's just been it was just something that i i had to do and i had no idea what it meant to make a game right this is like you know the only experience i've had of games was voicing bayek <laughs> right so the idea of making one was almost like it was alien territory but i i had to do it because it was the only way to to do right by him and he was a software engineer isn't that right at xerox yes yeah he was a software engineer at xerox we um yeah worked in welling garden city which was again like a really sort of it was is calm peaceful area which was really cool and he he you know c++ was his thing but he just uh he 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 appreciated the art of games, just never really kind of dove into it, but he, he allowed me to play it and, and enjoy it. And he listened to me whenever, and he'd watch as well, right? <laughs> the, my, my first early viewer or fan, my subscriber on Twitch, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and was, was he still around when you were uh, nominated for a BAFTA Games Award? No. So this is the thing. He passed away just before I had graduated from drama school. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So he, he wasn't able to really see, I mean, even before I got an agent, he wasn't able to really see, you know, where I got to or, or the work that he had essentially put into me getting to where I got to kind of come to fruition in a way. Yeah. When my, when my wife is thinking about her dad and my father is still around, my dad's mm. 80, we hear our dads in our own words. And I know I have a 16 year old and an 18 year old and I keep seeing my dad in reflections that, you know, like the, the, it's, it's his stride, it's his hair, it's his hairline. Right. Uh, right. I'm curious, you are, you're English, but yeah. you're first generation Kenyan. The accent, are you, is, are you your dad in this? Are you hearing I mean, your dad? I mean, all the time, <laughs> all the time. I, I mean, like I, I can, I can kind of, yeah, I mean, it definitely, definitely pulling from him. And it's definitely something that, uh, it's funny though, even when I speak to my family and when I speak to even my mother, like the, the accent kicks in. <laughs> like, so it's it's very much a, a thing. So yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I do find, I do even find, you know, not only within the game space, but even with, you know, my, my own daughter, like I can, I look at her and I'm like, oh my God, you were exactly like my father. Like I can see like the way you, that you furrow your brow, the you know the way you are, the way you even walk as well. Like it's it's very it's very surreal, um, very very surreal. Yeah, it's so amazing though to be able to make something, to create something, to birth something like a like a game or a piece of film or a piece of art, uh, you know, on your own as an homage to your to your dad. Mm. And how how long did it take to make the game though? Because you said yeah. you're not a triple A game studio with all. Absolutely respect. not. No way, man. <laughs> I mean, like I would say, it's funny, right? And I'm sure you know this as well. Like it took it took about four years from the inception of the studio to like where we are now to make this game. So over just a bit over four years, and um, really, truly though, <laughs> the thing that I didn't really realize, the game was made basically in a year. Like that final year of 2023 to like where we are now, like that's where the, the 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 bulk of this game came to because you know a lot of the, the within the four years, a lot of the time was spent, you know, me building a team from scratch, me learning as well what it means to make a game, you know, signing the deal with with EA, like all the admin -y stuff that you kind of forget about when it comes to running a business, like that was really part and parcel the, the most you know the, the the bulk of essentially getting the studio up and running the game itself you know we had a prototype and we had like you know elements of that and and building blocks here and there but truly like it's 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 fruition or it's it's final sort of elements came into that last year or a bit you know of of of, of dev time the, the decisions that one would have to make from a technical perspective, even though your dad was a software engineer, I don't know if you have a background in engineering at all. No, not at all. I mean, like I've, I've always been fascinated by it, but it is another language that terrifies me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then you must have, there must be uh, the other side, which is the CTO and you are the CEO. You must yeah. find a trusted person and that person picked a game engine and then you had to find a trusted yeah. art designer. Are you the showrunner at this point? 
basically pretty much yeah i mean like the way that i've kind of been and behaved is very much like the creative director showrunnery sort of person but funnily enough you know the picking the engine and and all that stuff again was very much early days like we started this game in unity um and then i remember talking to some of uh, some people who worked at epic about like, unreal and what they wanted to do with it and i think you know i was like oh this is very exciting let's go to unreal not realizing like you know <laughs> You know, the devs, I then had to relearn like how to use Unreal. But then, you know, what ended up happening is then you ended up, I ended up finding people who were, you know, specialized in Unreal to kind of build in that. And I found it a lot easier to kind of, I, you know, to get used to and use um, as a whole. But yeah, like even like, for example, like our CTO came in like the last year of development. (laughs) Like it was honestly building the team was one of those ones where, it was a massive learning, a huge learning, because again, you realize again, like you have to build a space that not only feels secure, but also you have to know what your your voice is in this industry, because there are a lot of games out there and there are a lot of industry and, and studios out there, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I brought up Prince of Persia, not just because it's a great game, mm. but it it came out like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, man. It's a busy Honestly. time. I mm. assume that you can hear whispers that a similar, and I say that in air quotes, a similar game in the sense of a 2.5D Metroidvania yep. side scroller with a with a kind of a painted art style. Mm. How do you make your game be recognized when this just behemoth and Jordan Mechner is out there, you know, promoting the heck out of it? But you yeah. have been noticed. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those ones where again. I think I just, you got to, the one thing that I've realized is because I play a lot of games, right? And I, the one thing that I think that I've, I have missed really is essentially the heart in it. You know, I think like I've, I really, you know, I really, I drove with this idea of like, look, even though this is our first game and it, you know, it, it it might do well, it might not. The idea though, is that we're, we're putting something out there with a lot of heart in and I think that's how you cut through, man. Like, I think, like, truly, like, for me, it was it was about bringing the artistic perspective to this. Because this is, this is you know, games, in my eyes, are, are a technical art, like a film or a TV show. They are all pieces of art. They're there to obviously entertain, but they're also there to kind of affect. And I think, like, that was something that I really wanted to do. Now, not to say that Prince of Persia doesn't have any heart. It has a lot of heart and the devs have put a lot of care into it. And you can see that through the work. It's a, it's a technical masterpiece. But I think like for me, the one thing that I, you know, that I knew was going to sort of um, aid and help this was essentially being like, look, this is, you know, giving people more context. I never really understood it as a gamer myself that the people behind the machine, if that makes any sense. And I was like, well, I want to show people that, you know, people actually make these things. You know, there are actually human beings behind this and they're driven by emotion and driven by wanting to do something really, you know, different. And so that was, you know, that was sort of the, 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 you know, from the get go where we kind of were driving from and that I feel aided us essentially being different. You know, in a way of like being like, oh yeah, it's 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 the game, you know, by that guy who went on the stage of the game awards and nearly cried. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. One of the other things that's interesting is a lot of these games uh build a uh, a mythos, they build lore, mm. and a lot of the lore is just pulled out of, you know, pulled out of nowhere. Uh, you know, you did some work on a uh, Game of Thrones spin-off, and you know, certainly George R. R. Martin did make yeah. stuff up. Right. He just makes up words. Yeah. But I was about an hour into the game and I started thinking, hang on a second. Impundulu, this is a real thing. Like, am I right? Yes, Impundulu, it's a lightning bird. It's like a Zulu myth. There's a Bantu mythology throughout this, but it seems like you're kind of. I don't know, it's fast and loose isn't the word. You are liberal in that you you pick from here in this country and a little bit of Zambia yeah. and a little bit of Kenya. Because I'm like, is this Swahili? Well, hang on, the words are Swahili, but he's picking a little Zulu here. Yeah. Is this is this all of like? You know, help me understand that. Like, help me. It's not one country. Yeah. It's something else. No. It's it's so for me. It was important again to to pull from uh, you know different Bantu spaces that not only inspired me on my journey of Mm. essentially wanting to tell the story. So like, for example, filming in South Africa when I was doing Raised by Wolves and talking to the people there, there was a feel, you know, there was a real feeling of learning a lot 
as I was out there, you know, talking to Sangomas as well out there and, and learning about the, you know, the elements of spirituality and healing in that spe- in that essence. It was, it was important for me to pull from these spaces to then inspire other people to be like, I wonder if this is real or not. Google it, realize that it is real and be like, I want to learn more. Because again, this is the, this is the richness and beauty of, of, you know, specifically with Bantu myth, you know, we don't even get me started on Yoruba, but like, it's like, you know, there is, there is so much, there's so many stories and so many characters and so many um, beings to sort of get introduced to. I, rather than give you one, you know, side, I want to give you as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so cool to me that you didn't have to make up a bunch of stuff again, with all due respect Mm. to our friends at Game of Thrones, but like, just digging into like Asan Goma, which is a traditional healer in South Africa, and Ahmad Lozi, and the 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 ghosts of your ancestors, and this yeah. is all real stuff. However, we have a dozens or maybe even thousands of games that do. Oh, it's Zeus again. Oh, yeah. it's Norse. You know what I mean? Like we've all got that Northern Hemisphere gods pantheon. Exactly. I don't exactly. know how many Assassin's Creed games there are with you know, mean, there's somebody involved from Northern from, Hemisphere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And this is this is the thing. Like for me, and again, I I, I remember people being like, um, "Oh, are you doing it because of Black Panther?" And I'm like, "Well, not really. I'm just doing it because it's my perspective. Like I'm in the driving seat. I can actually, you know, make these decisions. And you know, a lot of the stories that my father, you know, would 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 give me were, were very much inspired by these spaces and places. You know, when I was in South Africa, for example, I was asking these questions because I'm in South Africa and, you know, my, you know, my my friends are either Zulu or Kosa, you know? So it makes just sense to, for me, when it comes to telling stories, I'm coming at it from this perspective rather than necessarily like the Norse myth or the Greek myth or anything like that, you know? Because I, and, and yeah, you're right. There is a lot of Norse mythology, you know, Greek mythology games and, you know, even sometimes Celtic, but like truly it's about, again, that's just, you know, what they are interested in or their perspective. And and that's totally fine and cool to do. It's just, this is, this is my vibe now. (laughs) Yeah. And I think also it's a rich vein. It's a huge untapped storytelling world that Mm. has not been seen. And I have to give you credit and the team credit because it is easy to have fallen. It would have been easy to fall in the, oh, it's like a Black Panther game because people are excited about a completely fictional African nation that yeah. doesn't exist. And we all love Black Panther and Black Panther 2. But, you know, like they speak Isikmosa because that that's what, the, the, uh, you know, um, his dad spoke, the the South African actor. Yeah. yeah. Spoke, and like, okay, we'll just do that. They kind of adopted little pieces. Yeah. You really stayed true to these myths and it sent me down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. That's the, that was it. That was I'm done. I'm done. I can sign that out. Mission accomplished. <laughs> that mission accomplished. Yeah, exactly. I honestly I remember telling the team, like, look, as long if we can get anyone or convince anyone to go down a wiki wormhole, we've done our job. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. And and I'm talking to like our our family in South Africa in Zimbabwe, and I'm asking them about myths, and some of them don't remember them. And they're like, Well, yeah, I kind of remember that. So it's right. actually digging up previous memories of things that they were told when they were five or six, but, but aren't, you know, in this kind of post-colonial world, we don't really think about them as much. No, no. Um, And now we are again. And I just think it's so cool to have, 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 you know, I don't know. I don't know why I assumed that it was just made up. And then I was like, because I've been, like I said, I've been married to a Indibeli for 25 years. Like I, I can speak the language like a five-year-old. Right. So I'm like, hang on a second. This is all, this is why he, cause we actually stayed in, um, now I'm off on a tangent now. We stayed at, we, we spent time in Nairobi and also in parts of Tanzania because my sister-in-law worked at the UNICTR uh, at the, at the tribunal there. So okay. we've driven from Arusha all the way up through and across the border. So we've been all over the the continent and I've got all these, the meter of speech and all of these, 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 these words and these pieces in, in our heads. And mm. for now to be, to be able to share the game with my wife and with my kids who have a foot in I each mean, world. That's really cool, right? Oh, that's, man. It's that's hella cool. Yeah. Cause I mean, yeah, it's that idea for me. It's, it's again, it's, it's like these stories, a lot of these stories aren't necessarily remembered because they're mainly, you know, spoken. Like that's the, that's the thing about Bantu tales. They're, they're, it's an oral storytelling tradition. 
Griot, so for example, yeah, you know, yeah. would be, and and I think like that's how it can easily be forgotten. Like only rarely are there some books, and you know, either the books are written by you know people who kind of get it but don't, but then they're all they're written. You know, but I've got the uh, a book by Credo Mutua, which was uh, you know he, he was also a Sangoma who you know wrote his stories. But then again, they're all perspectives, right? And this is the beauty of the oral storytelling tradition. It's like you would tell me a story. Um, and I would then, you know, you might have the Mpundalu as like, you know, as a small, you know, lightning bird, I'd go and tell my daughter and it's this huge thing, you know what I mean? And so like, that's, you know, that's, that was the beauty of it as well. You could change bits and make it your own and, and play with it that way. So that was something that was, you know, really important to kind of do as well was to kind of have this element of oral storytelling to the game as a whole. Yeah. Do you think that um, this is a moment, though, for for I mean, I know this was made, was this made in uh, in England. Where is your studio yeah. located? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a remote studio. So, it, it, oh, you know, yeah. it was it That's was important. Nice. For, yeah, it was important for me. You know, a lot of the you know concept art when I started this game, again, no idea what it means to make a game. All I knew is that you need a really cool art right to begin with. Of course. A lot of the concept art where, where we started was done by. Um, an artist called Godwin Akpan, who's in Nigeria. Um, you know, now we've got uh, Tumo, who's in Botswana. Um, Idris as well, Ibrahim Idris, who's also in Nigeria. Like, a South African artist as well, did a lot of the work while we were, you know, 3D work as well. Like, it, we're, we're all over the place. You know, we've got people in New York. You know, it, it, we had people working in France. We've got, you know, mainly specific, like, mainly people are in England, but ultimately we're a remote studio. That's amazing. And, like... Say what you will about COVID, but it made remote work happen. Oh man, it really did. All right. and, we're doing and, this remotely. Yeah, Borders don't absolutely. matter anymore. Yeah, that's basically. And you know, the thing is, is like we were always going to be a remote studio. It was kind of like a by chance that COVID hit and was like, oh well, this is the normal way of working now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to dig into a little bit is the the feel the the part that blows me away the most about a game is that there's a loop an inner loop that they call yeah. the game pay loop gameplay loop it's it's hard to explain especially on a podcast but do your hands feel right does your body move correctly do you yeah. lean forward when you're trying to make a certain wall jump and are, are you know is the is this the left bumper is that what it should do or should it be the right bumper what makes right. your hands feel right there's some punishing platforming in this game this i know game. i mean <laughs> i don't i was in, in act one trying to get up to the baobab tree yeah i spent probably 20 minutes trying to wall jump there and i'm thinking to myself like am i i felt like i was competing against you because you're in a room somewhere talking about milliseconds with the team yeah trying to decide the right amount of milliseconds for you to to have that window to yeah. press the button. Are you deciding those things? Are the team deciding that the feel of it in your hands yeah, should feel a certain way? It's 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 a mix of both. You know, I I you know, for me, I really told the team like I mean it's like you okay, put it this way. The the, the team that I formed have never really built a metroidvania before and they've never built a side scroller before. They are, you know, most of the team are are very much developers who come from, you know, either like the Hitman series or, you know, or big sort of, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it, this is like the first time. Do it. So this is also why I was like, I'm going to throw everyone in the deep end. So, you know, one of the things that they're very, what we were good at though, or what we wanted to do was we wanted to kind of capture this element of it feeling like a dance, but at the same time you have to be precise you know and i think like that is that is what has been key to conveying this feeling of grief of the journey of grief the feeling that it does feel like you're kind of in this you know this loud music like you know the music is pumping it's crazy you kind of there's a lot of noise but but if you really focus you can hear the beat of the drum and that's how you essentially figure out and find the way of jumping, oh. dashing, jump, jump, dash. And it's like, so that's why we really want, that's what we really wanted to do. It's almost like a lot of the people who I find myself anyway, when I play games, um, sometimes you attack the controller and the more you kind of get frustrated, the more attacking you, you attack, you know, the more you kind of keep attacking the controller. When actually the way to kind of beat this is the opposite. Every time you fail, you get karma. Because that's essentially the way. Again, that's that journey of grief. Oh man, uh, people can't see me, or maybe they will if they put if I put this on YouTube. But like, 
you just blew my mind. So I've been playing this for the last several you know weeks since it came out, but I played it for the last two hours, literally right up until five minutes before you came on. Because right. I wanted to have the feeling in my hands. And I was going up and down this freaking, this one section where you have to not wall jump two or three times, but it's precise wall jump, wall jump, half of a double jump, smash over. You know, just, it was very, and I was getting so angry. And then I end up on an elevator where there's like every level is new yeah, bad guys. new enemies, yeah. And I'm chasing after this little girl who's always one step uh, away. Yeah. And I was getting so freaking mad. And I just, I did it. You, you manipulated me. You, I was, I was button mashing. Yeah. And I that, literally put the thing down and I went, this freaking game, man. Okay. That's, and I was that's, like, d- 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 pop, 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 pop. And you're absolutely right. And it was, yeah. it, and it was not a rhythm game, but it was for a moment. Yeah. Until I got I mean, to the top. And then I went, Ah, and all the tension came out of my shoulders. And that's, and that's the thing. That's the thing. Like, I think with, with me, I remember, <laughs> I remember again, and I'm still, am. sometimes I have my moments where I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling so emotional and I get lost in it. And like, you know, and I feel like I'm getting frustrated. And I keep getting frustrated and, and I'm not being able to do it. And it's only until I actually take a breather, stop and just, I'm like, actually, hold on. I can do this. Is when you yeah. do it. It's yeah. like you know. It's that. It's I. The, the feeling reminiscent is to like when you keep failing a Sonic level or like a Mario level. <laughs> you know, the, the more you fail it, the the harder it gets because yeah. you're like, oh god, and you keep getting frustrated and you keep thinking about it too much. When actually, oh, yeah. the, the, the trick is to not think about it. Yeah, you know that is exactly. I was. I was. You were evoking Mario. You were evoking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all of these games and I could feel it in my hands and I was like, this thing's, this thing's broken. There's, there's a timing problem here. There's something wrong. There's <laughs> he just adds a couple hundred milliseconds there. It'll be fine. And then I yeah. walked away and I stretched my hands and I came back and I got the tempo and I, and I made it, and it was hard. I mean, you know, the level I'm talking about. Yeah. It was, yeah. I wouldn't say punishing because I don't like games that are punitive. No, but I know it you was mean. unapologetic. And yeah. there are unapologetic uh, insta death, yes, things as well, which is a very conscious decision to make an insta. Yeah, I mean, moment. like, yeah, I know. I, I, it was one of those ones where I, I think <laughs> it's funny. Again, you, you, and this is this is also something that I'm also learning, right? You making this game as a developer, you spend four years in this space, so you play it, and you don't really notice those elements as much. Give it to someone who's new and fresh to this whole world they're noticing it a lot, you know? And I think like in my mind, I'm like, ah, okay, I get it. It's a bit like, I keep thinking about the first Ori, for example. Oh yeah. The first Ori was punishing, especially to the point where you didn't have any checkpoints. It was always to the last save you made. So you're always thinking about that last save that you had to make, because if you didn't make that save, you would have to start all the way back again. And it was, oh my God, it was, it was horrifying. So like for me, I can imagine like the developers being like, yeah, this is a great idea. This is cool. And they're able to get it because they know the world and what it is. But then when you come to a new player, you're like, oh my God, this is like, this is taxing. You know what I mean? Like, exactly. I've got time to do this again. So yeah, yeah, it is very much those. And look, I mean, like the insta death elements as well, like truly it's it was a feeling of, you know, something that we wanted to do, especially with platforming. You don't want to coast something. You don't want to, you know, be able to kind of get knocked back and then suddenly just keep carrying on because then you don't think about what you're doing. You're just like, oh, okay, hit me and then you move on. That's the thing about those thorns. The thorns, which are, you know, kind of ready pink, when they knock you back a bit, they take a bit of your health, but they're not really threatening. You can kind of move on. But every time you see those really white spikes, those insta-death spikes, you're like, oh, buddy, I've got to think about this now. I've got to be really careful. And that invokes an emotion. And that's the thing. It invokes something in you that makes you think like, I've got to really think about what I'm about to do here because any false move is going to set me back. That's so true. And some of those spikes, you like, oh, I'll just jump over them. Well, no, you won't because there's another one, right? Exactly. Right, at the exactly. apex of your jump. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and I'm thinking to myself, it, you did that on purpose. <laughs> this is the thing. The thing is, it's, it's a good way also of... For me, because it's like, you know, I'm, I'm watching my wife play, for example, and it's a good way of her learning what, you know, the idea of actually, oh yeah, precision jumping, depending on how hard I press that X button, it allows me to kind of alter the height of the jump. 
And honestly, you could see that she was doing this like three or four or five times. She's never played games before. But when she did it, that feeling of elation, she, it, it's, it's, you can't, you can't replicate that stuff, man. Yeah, you really can't. It's been an absolute joy to play. And I got to say, like, I know you said that it's, you're a small studio, but I played Metroid Dread a couple of uh, months ago. I'm in the middle of Prince of Persia. Uh, I'm in the middle of Tales of Kinzera Zhao. You put them side by side. You can't tell what the AAA game is and what the single A game is. Oh, man. Thank I'm you so you, much, man. buddy. Honestly, Thank you. the last question I wanted to ask you is the, the price point. Yeah. <laughs> it's, this is a bargain for the number of hours you get. That must yeah. have been a conscious decision as well. Yeah, it's man. not a sixty dollar game. No. You can get it for twenty, thirty bucks. It yeah, was- twenty bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was one of those ones again. Like I again, you know, I I'm very much aware that gaming is a, is a, as a hobby is quite expensive, right? For for anyone. I remember when I was growing up, I could basically only get like one game a year. Like literally, it was. It was very difficult. So when it came to deciding about what the price point is, I remember talking to EA about this and, you know, talk about this, 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 and the other. And we were essentially like, actually, what's the price of pizza? (laughs) You know, when you order a pizza or you order a takeout, like, what's that going to be like? And essentially, we were like, oh, it's about, you know, 20 bucks or, you know, 16.99 here, for example. Like, well, you get it, make it the price of pizza. Think that people are, you know, are, are, are stealing from the company, man. Like give them something really good. Cause you don't feel bad when you eat a pizza, like a pizza is good. Right. So that to me was really important. It was important to make this game as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. That doesn't necessarily feel like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm having to break my own bank account or, or decide whether I'm going to do shopping for the week or buy a video game. Because I yeah. feel like that's essentially the, the space that we're kind of jumping into a bit. So yeah, it was important to to make this a price point that felt accessible to as many people as possible, but also give them the experience and, you know, the high fidelity of a game that feels good, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. These $70 games are getting out of control. But crazy. Uh, the number of hours of value that has already been provided, like for the price of a pizza or a movie ticket, yeah. uh, you know, it's already, uh, it's already proven itself. Um, it you. has been an absolute joy chatting with you, sir. I could talk to you for another hour, I'm sure. And I want to oh, thank you for it. spending time with me today. No, thank you for having me, man. Really, really appreciate it. Tales of Kinzera Zhao is available now on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 5, Xbox, and Windows under the EA Originals publishing label. You can get it everywhere that you get games. I want to thank Abu Bakr Salam for spending time with me today. And this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.